Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 104, Sinclair Performance Institute, Success and Tangibles, with Dr. David Jared Sinclair, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we head out west, do a little California dreaming with one of the leading business performance coaches in the United States and begin the conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest is business performance coach, Dr. Jared Sinclair, and I'm super excited to have him on the show. Before he started helping people, their businesses, and organizations reach higher levels of excellence, Mr. Sinclair was an active Marine, serving his country in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as a retired San Diego, California police officer, and also holds a doctorate in organizational change and leadership. So he maybe hadn't had a hockey journey, but he's definitely had an eventful life journey, and we're going to hear all about it. One thing I continuously find interesting, as I enjoy participating in this movie called Life, is how certain people come into our lives. I can't remember who wrote it or where I read it, but there is a quote someone made that for some reason stuck with me since I read it nearly a decade ago, and it goes something like this. People come into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. When you figure out which one it is, you will know what to do for each person. I know the reason Mr. Sinclair and the Sinclair Performance Institute came into my life And that's so he can pass on his knowledge, his success formula that he's been teaching to a wide variety of clients representing many different sectors in the business world. It doesn't matter if you're an actor, realtor, musician, mathematician, nonprofit founder, piano extraordinaire, entrepreneur, professional athlete, or just a regular Joe trying to make today a little better than yesterday. The formula is pretty much the same across the board. If you want to go from average to good to great, there are success and tangibles you need to know about and learn, and that's exactly what Dr. Jared Sinclair is going to be discussing with me here today. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Dr. Jared Sinclair. Mr. Sinclair, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Awesome, Lance. I'm I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, how we kind of got connected is uh, my childhood friend who has also been on this podcast, Chris Hansen, who has a nonprofit called Time on the Water. Um, he hired you to kind of help him with uh, all the stuff that he has going on. And you recently got into the podcasting biz and it was right around the NHL uh, Stanley Cup finals there. So it was perfect timing to have a retired guy on your, your show. Uh, so that's how we got connected. And I, I thought you'd be a great guest because uh, you have a, a, a great journey. It may not be a hockey journey, but uh, you know, you, you served your country as a Marine. You still are. Uh, you uh, were in law enforcement for, for many, many years. And now you are a business performance coach. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to talk about. So what I do with all the interviews that I have is I'd like to uh, rewind the tape a little bit and go back, take a look in the rearview mirror and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends? Uh, what sports did you play? Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Jared Sinclair. Yeah. So I grew up in uh, Southern California. I was fortunate enough to, to stay in the same home 
uh, my entire childhood till I left for the Marine Corps. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, yeah. I've got, got two younger sisters and older brother. Um, and growing up, you know, parents are together. My mom uh, has passed away recently. My father's still around. He's out in Texas. So uh, growing up, you know, normal, normal life, right? Uh, rowdy, rowdy boys go to the park. I uh, did a lot of BMX riding, uh, got into mountain biking. I was a bander, played the trombone and the piano. My, my mother would force me to play the piano when I turned five. Uh, I had to do that till I got into <laughs> <laughs> about middle school. I mean, it's a great experience, right? Because you're stretching, you know, you're stretching yourself. And I'm all about that. I played, uh, played the trombone. I was a little bit of a band nerd going into middle school and high school. But uh, what a great experience. And, and I would say probably one of the greatest mentors I ever had came of that, out of that experience. Um, his name was Mr. Wolf, and he was a band teacher. But uh, what an exceptional human being who would always push his students to, to achieve that next level. And when I, when I think back about my time, you know, in the band with Mr. Wolf, middle school, high school, I think about those times where I was pushed beyond my capability and beyond my comfort zone. So I think a lot of that stuff, uh, you know, comes together and, and assimilates and, and brings, it, brings it all together for who we are today. So great experience there. Uh, through high school, played basketball. Um, and then growing up, you know, did a lot of soccer, uh, baseball, little league, football type stuff. So I kind of ran the circuit there. Uh, at the end of high school, you know, I wanted to get out of Southern California. Um, I wanted to be a cop, so I joined the Marine Corps. I uh, did 10 years in the Marine Corps, saw Afghanistan, saw other countries around the world, uh, led several teams, did some pretty pretty high-speed stuff um, in support of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. So that was fun. Uh, met a lot of people uh, around the world. Once I left the Marine Corps, I uh, took a job at the local police department in San Diego County, worked the road probably for about four years, promoted, and I worked basically uh, specialized units from there on out. So everything from vice narcotics to uh, supervising the, the team that does human trafficking, fugitive apprehension, internal affairs, um, hostage negotiations, et cetera. And during my time there, I kind of knew it wasn't the end for me. It wasn't certainly wasn't a terminal career. I felt like I was outgrowing and outpacing the opportunities that they could provide me at that specific organization. So went back to grad school, um, completed grad school at USC with a doctorate in organizational change and leadership. And during that time, really started cutting my teeth doing consulting. I, I started doing nonprofit consulting pro bono because I knew there was a gap there. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the government sector moved up into some leadership positions, management positions uh, in the local government with the PD as well. But I, I knew there was a gap there with the, the business side. So offered my services to nonprofits. And as I was going through school, building that expertise in organizational change, business and leadership, um, I was providing services to them, kind of honing my framework. And as a result of that, I was able to jump uh, away from law enforcement in the government sector about uh, two years ago. And since then, I've been consulting full time for both clients in the government sector as well as in the nonprofit sector and the private sector. So it's been it's been a great journey. And I, I just thoroughly am, enjoy helping people achieve that next level, expanding capacity, expanding their leadership, uh, improving their performance and accelerating growth. Those are really the things that I focus on. So. Uh, yes, that it has been quite a journey for you, and we're gonna we're gonna take a, a segment of that and go back as I, I have some questions because I think that um, everything is a stepping stone with these experiences. But uh, I don't come from a military family, but I married. I guess my my I guess I, I do because my dad was uh, he went to Vietnam, but he I guess it didn't seem like that because he wasn't, uh, you know, in the fighting part of it. He was just flying uh, the cargo deals. But, you know, the the one thing I know is that the military, what that instills in people is a discipline that maybe they didn't know existed or that there are higher levels of it. And once you understand it and uh, kind of work that process for a while, it, it kind of transforms you into the person who you are going to become after you're out of the military. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree 100%. I think the experience is there and just the, the intent focus on achievement 
achieving that that next goal or that mission, and then developing the awareness uh, of your environment of maybe the resources you have on hand, and then the agility to operate within that, are are skill sets that you know transcend time and, and and space. It doesn't matter what environment it is, you can apply those skill sets wherever you may find yourself, whether it's hockey, whether it's sports, whether it's you know music or, or business. So when you when you decided you were going to go into the Marines, uh, what was the hardest part that you had to you know experience before you you know got awarded that that uh, that level of expertise where you became a marine a marine? Yeah, you know that's a funny. I was talking to my boys about this uh, actually this week. I uh, during boot camp I lost sixty four pounds. And Marine Corps boot camp is <laughs> yeah, Marine Corps boot camp is ninety days long, right? So you can imagine just going in, you know, at, at two thirty or whatever it was, and coming out at like one sixty something, just um, shredded. Yeah, but that's what they do. They build machines, and that's what the Marine Corps does. And so I would say the hardest part uh, for me, and it wasn't really a thought while I was there until the tail end. But it was it was like, wow, like I, I didn't eat much and I drank a lot of water and I worked out a lot. And uh, I would say that just coming out on the tail end of that was probably the greatest accomplishment um, that was forced upon me, I guess you could say, uh, in my adult life. I'd say aside from that, uh, it's the environment, you know, because those environments are designed specifically to build uh, Marines, build machines. Right. Guys that will and gals that will go out there and just handle business. Um I think for me, it was the ability to come alongside of all these different guys from different lifestyles um, and just seeing them respond to structure. You know, you have kids, young men that, that grow up in very different households and very different life experiences and just bringing everybody onto the same page was a phenomenal learning experience for me because they, that's what they do. They break everybody down and then they build them right back up onto that same page. So everybody has that common ground. Um, I'd say that was the more challenging thing was getting along with the multiple personalities and various uh, upbringings and, and skill sets and, and perspectives from, from around the world. But in the end, everybody's on the same page with the same mission. How, how did you get through? Did you, well, let me, did you had to have had some moments where you're like, I, I, I'm quitting. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. How did you get through that? Uh, I laughed it off. You know, because really there's only one way to do things and that's to do things. And I came to that realization early on, um, you know, that whole concept of just embracing the suck. Like this sucks, right? Like we're we're in these sand pits sweating, you know, I'll be at San Diego. It's not like South Carolina where it's super hot, but it's it's hot nonetheless. And we're throwing sand up in the air and everybody's sweating and everybody's getting dirty. But, you know, when you when you kind of break it down, it's fun because who else gets to do that stuff? You know, yeah. who else intentionally goes out and do, does that stuff? So I tried to find that silver lining, um, you know, when things were getting tough or things were getting, uh, you know, scary. Uh, I wasn't a super good swimmer growing up. And when we hit the pool, that was kind of intimidating. But, um, you know, pushing yourself to that next level, I've always had that thing inside of me that says push, push to that boundary and then go a little bit further. So for me, although it was tough and although it was, um, you know, comfortable at times, just just finding the drive to dive inside, you know, and, and look inside of me to see what I had and bringing that out was, was probably the most helpful thing that I did uh, during that time. And then letters from home, letters from home are really cool. You know, letter from mom, right. Letter from grandma. So those were, those were very, uh, very helpful things that kind of, you know, you, you take your mind off of what's going on in the moment and it takes you back to, to all of those things that are still encapsulated in your mind and all those good times. So it was good. Yeah, that's, um, I have a, um, one of my, two of my brother-in-laws, one, one's, uh, in the army. Hi, he's been, a, he's been a lifer. And another one just recently retired from the Navy SEALs. Nice. And their, their, uh, their father was, a a Vietnam vet, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I I love hearing the stories, <clears throat> but the one thing um, that's you know I, I I can't I can't fathom I have no idea because uh, if you're leading a team or you're the head of a, an organization and you put together a plan and you start to execute it in the business world you know you fail you know maybe someone loses some money you lose a job but you know you got to pivot but 
you know, in the military, in law enforcement, you know, one little mistake and people get hurt or people die. How, how challenging is that? And, you know, how do you cope with that knowing that the, the stakes are so high? Yeah. I mean, first off, uh, I think it comes down to training and, and mindset. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's, you know, if we're talking law enforcement specific, there's agencies across the nation that don't get money allocated for training. So unfortunately, though, those folks are, are kind of at a disadvantage. Um, where, where I was in, in San Diego County specifically, uh, we, we had a very robust training program. And across the board in law enforcement down here, training is a big part. So what we tried to do, even when I was on the training team, we would try to automate responses. Um, but that comes down to building good training programs. So you really have to dive into how do we automate a response where we have people doing things that they are supposed to do appropriately in alignment with policy, procedure, law, effectiveness, you know, however you want to structure it. How do we automate those behaviors? So when they're having to make a decision in a quarter of a second, that decision is already being made. It's already automated into their body, into their, their response mechanism before they've even consciously processed it, right? So, so that was the challenge. But I think with that training comes confidence. Um, you know, much like hockey, if you're learning how to work a puck on a stick or you're, you know, you're learning how to skate or whatever the case may be, you know, there's these building blocks and there's ways to structure that meaning making and those skill sets in a way that the body responds or it can, you know, crawl, walk, run, if you will. Yeah. Um, and we'll continue to push to that next level. So you might crawl, rock, run, but what's that next skill you can put on top of that skill, right? Can you crawl, walk, run while you're talking? Can you crawl, walk, run while you're communicating? Can you crawl, walk, run while you're shooting, uh, whether it's a hockey puck or, um, you know, a weapon. So that's really the ultimate goal is to, to structure these things and to scaffold these things in a way that, um, you know, skill sets are built and then you can continue to build and refine and make more effective and efficient uh, those skill sets that you've already learned. And just to, I mean, it, it just, see, you talk about, you just, you train and train and train until you, you can't get it wrong. Uh, I, it's, it's like, I mean, is it, is it like in the movies where there is just chaos going all over, but because of the training, you can keep your wits and stay calm and make the, the, the decisions and the calls that need to be made. Yeah. I, I I think so. I think that exposure, that exposure, that stress inoculation, um, you know, my experiences in the Marine Corps, my experiences in Afghanistan really prepared me for the streets, you know, as a supervisor running a, a larger scene, because in some of those scenes, you have multiple people, you know, you could have anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 people um, operating in the same space, trying to work towards the same goal, but it's chaos. And sometimes it's violent and sometimes it's dangerous. And being able to take a step back from that and have the awareness to make the decisions that need to be made in the moment without having that emotional or that visceral response and then directing resources is, is incredibly important, you know, especially in today's, you know, litigious age or, or age where, like you said, we're one decision away or military guys or, you know, even hockey players are one decision away from making a bad decision that could affect the outcome of whatever they're working on, whether it's a game or whether it's an apprehension or, or whether it's a military operation. So I think, I think the ability to assess your environment or read the field, make decisions that are going to um, result in some type of outcome and furtherance of your bigger goal is, is the value there. And that upbringing in the military uh, really helped me build that awareness where I could apply it to the, the law enforcement realm. And then from there, because I'm so accustomed to chaos and things not going right and things going sideways and, and reading people and watching people and watching scenarios, it really played in well to, to my work that I do uh, with my clients at Sinclair Performance Institute. Yeah. And we're, we're getting there. We're getting there, young man. Just, uh, you know, hang on. <laughs> so I have, uh, they, I have a question. Uh, now, you know, you, you're after 10 years, you're, you, you leave the military. 
Um, you don't, you didn't retire. You just got out of there and you get into law enforcement. And I just, how do you guys do that? You, everyone that's in that type of business. And, um, we have another friend that's, uh, she's, uh, an ambulance, uh, paramedic. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys, uh, see more, uh, violence and hardship and, you know, just stuff that the normal person doesn't see. You see more in a week than most people see in a lifetime, for sure, in a decade. You know, how do you go home and interact with your kids and be normal? I mean, what, do you go, do you talk to someone? I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, when it's kind of a journey. Yeah, I know there's some some other folks that have similar experiences. Um, I went through these, I'll just talk about my journey and the way that I kind of went through that stuff is I, I, uh, I used to just bottle it up and push on, right. And press on. And I found myself being angry and being impatient and being frustrated, you know, and then I came to the point where it's like, well, this isn't a way to live your life, you know? So I, there are some resources out there. Um, I, I talk vehemently about it. I mean, it's very important that, that this, um, you know, the mental health stuff and uh, suicide prevention and, and just a high, high capacity performance, right? It requires that mental awareness and that mental acuity and that, that clarity that comes with having a sound, healthy mind. So what I did is I sought out, I sought out some professionals and I'm, I'm a big proponent of EMDR. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but EMDR, no. EMDR is a therapy that basically des desensitizes um, you know, those, those memories that might come up or might influence future decisions or decisions in the moment. So I, I found EMDR to be very helpful for me. Um, and, and then working through some of those scenarios that I encountered in Afghanistan, the scenarios that I encountered, you know, the violence, the level of violence and, um, you know, exposure to things that people aren't supposed to or aren't built to be exposed to at the frequency or level to which they are. Uh, in the police force or as a firefighter or as a paramedic, um, you can be expected one day to go to, let's say a baby non-breather, right. To right. an hour later, going to a suicide to an hour later, going to a double fatal, you know, um, car crash where the car's on fire. Um, so just the, just having that constant chronic stress and not having that time to decompress can, can wreck somebody's, somebody's, uh, perspective on the world, right? Um, their perspective of themselves, it could wear them out. And then that in turn, you know, goes down the sleep route, you start losing sleep, you start losing sleep, you start putting on weight, start putting on weight, you have health issues. So it's kind of the spiral that goes downhill. Um, so I would encourage anybody in that position to seek help. I mean, there's so many really great uh, therapies out there to, to work through PTSD or, or even uh, depression or anxiety. Um, there's no stigma around it anymore. There used to be. Just go out and get it. Talk to your friends about it. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be weird. It can just be everybody goes through it. So I think that's one of the things that helped me cope was finally coming to terms with the fact that pushing this down isn't being helpful and seeking that professional help uh, is beneficial to work through some of those things that, that us as humans were not designed to be exposed to at that frequency or at that quantity. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, it's it's an important message that continues to needs to continue to be uh, talked about all the time because um, it, it there was a black cloud over it for uh, some time, and now I, I agree that that's uh, that's changing. So, uh, what I'd like to do right now, I mean, this is perfect timing for me because we're coming up on uh, Independence Day. And I just want to thank you, you know, for preserving what, uh, you know, that that day represents in in your military service and also a lot uh, law enforcement service. Uh, Jared, thank you very much for for all that you have done and you continue to do uh, in that sector. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm happy. Happy I did it. Happy I was able to contribute. Awesome. So I, I imagine that. Uh, the stress is a little less now that you're you're out of those jobs <laughs> <laughs> and working with uh, some passionate people. So let's transition to that. Uh, you know, how did you get into what you're doing now? Kind of uh, 
spell that out for us? Yeah. So, uh, like I said before, I was doing pro bono work. I knew I knew there was a gap there. Um, you know, leaving the government sector and getting into to business consulting or performance consulting. So I started working with nonprofits, and as I was going through grad school, I developed a framework that uh, I refined while I was working with these these businesses. And then since then, uh, I've found that you know, anytime anytime we have people involved in the system, we're going to have people and system problems. So in order to improve performance, we're going to have to put the people at the center and focus yeah. on, on how people function and how people work, how they learn, what motivates them, um, what's the best way to communicate with them. And then we should be building systems around them. If the system's in place, then we need to train the humans. We need to give them the knowledge and, and provide them with learning opportunities to operate within those specific systems. So I developed a framework around that. And because businesses are systems, and people are in systems, um, it seems to, to work. And I'm getting really good results from it with the clients that I'm working with. Um, not only results like they feel that it's working and they have these kind of subjective feelings, but actual tangible um, results where, where they're seeing changes occur, um, you know, through growth, through capacity building, through their ability to take on additional financial um, obligations or, you know, expand their capacity through, uh, their higher performance. So it's been, it's been fun to watch this kind of evolve, you know, just this incremental building and refinement of making the system, making my offerings better for the clients that I serve. So what type of uh, businesses or, you know, sectors are the people that you're working with? Are they in? Yeah. So currently I'm working with some in the real estate industry. I'm working with some in the nonprofit industry. I have, some in the government sector, and then one in the construction industry. So we'll, I'll do everything from executive coaching to um, designing learning and development plans to strategic planning to strategic communication plans. What I'll typically do is come alongside these businesses and, and use the stakeholders that are in them to build ad hoc teams. And together we work to address those issues um, under a framework. The framework that I use is called, it's called SMAC. I used to call it Mask C, but I had a real good mentor. He's a dental friend of mine. He, uh, he's like, hey man, that's his SMAC. So I'm like, oh yeah, let's, just, let's use SMAC. So I switched it up a little bit. But uh, SMAC basically focuses on the systems for the S, you know, the M is motivation. And the A is accountability, the C is communications, and the K is knowledge. So within those um, letters in that acronym, you know, we can go three to five levels deep on what attributes of systems do we need to focus on with your organization? Um, let's dive into motivation. Like what attributes of motivation are there gaps in right now? And then we develop a plan to close those gaps or to bridge those gaps. So I get in front of a lot of hockey players in my uh, training business who are super passionate have lofty goals and want to achieve something more than average. Sure. Uh, as you just mentioned, there's a, there's a formula to follow. I mean, you're in a lot of different sectors, but you're, you're, you're pretty much doing the same thing. Uh, one of the fathers, the dads of the a kid that I trained, he said, I got an idea for you for, for a podcast, success intangible. So uh, I threw it out to you. Mm -hmm. Um what would you say to some of these kids? I mean, that are going to be listening to this. Uh, if if they want to accomplish something big, what are some success intangibles that can be learned in order to increase the chances of uh, success? Yeah. So I think I think it's vitally important to know where you are right now. Um, where are you at? You know, you're in a hockey space. So in a hockey space, where are you at right now as a player or as a coach? Right, uh, coaching players. Where's your team at? So being able to, to identify that and not in, not in really a subjective way, but to put numbers on it. And the reason why that's important, I think we talked about um, when I had you on my show was the, you actually did a study on puck possession time. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a great example of using a metric to, to, to find a starting point, right? Because without that starting point, you don't know if you're moving the needle, right? So the right. whole purpose of training, the whole purpose of education, the whole purpose of learning 
is to change behavior. So if you don't know where you're starting or where you've started, then how do you know you've changed behavior? So breaking it down to that level where you have stats, where you have some type of number um, that you can go towards. And then you need that end goal, right? So with that end goal, where do you want to be? And sometimes that end goal is open, but it might be more subjective. Like, I just want to be a better hockey player. Okay, well, let's break that down. What does that look like? And it might be, you know, shots. How many shots are you going to take? Puck possession. Um, it might be blocks. It might be how fast are you, right? Is there a specific skills deficiency that you're missing or that you want to improve upon? And then listing those things. And then I think one of the mistakes that, you know, folks do is they list all these things and they try to tackle all of them at one time. And I think you've mentioned it before where you wanted to rebuild your, your, um, your shots. You started shooting left hand, right? Yeah. What an incredible way to do it because in order to do that, you have to start small and then you have to build upon that. And there's ways, there's ways that, that you can do those things, but it's about building a system around it and then working that system, tracking your progress and then continuing to work towards that end goal. So within that, within that, you know, there's a lot of issues there with motivation, right? How do you keep going if you're not seeing progress? How do you keep going if you had a bad night? How do you keep going if, if you're just not getting it? So there's a lot of things that you can do in the motivation realm that'll help you stay motivated as an individual. Or if you're a coach working with a team, or let's say you're a peer, you know, your buddies and, and both of you are trying to work on a specific skill set. There's things that you can do to help your partners along in that. And then there's things that you can do yourself to help your part, to help yourself work towards that. And the reason I say building blocks is because if you throw everything at somebody all at once, oftentimes they're going to be overloaded, right? So I would practice that smallest thing, that smallest aspect of that thing that you are trying to improve upon until you can't get it wrong or until it's close to perfect. Once you do that, then add the next thing, right? And as you do that, you're going to have these groups of things that you've become good at that then you can start practice them, practicing them in a serial manner. So now you're tying those things that you became really good at, but now you're combining them and practicing them together, right? And then after that, now you're, now you're practicing additional small skill sets that tie into those skill sets. And pretty soon what you find is you have this giant repertoire of things that you can do that you never thought of were possible, or if you try to tackle them as a whole, it wouldn't have worked because it would have just been too much. So I think those building blocks um, are important. And then chasing, chasing those metrics, like I said, making sure that you're making that constant improvement um, in that. And then there's, there's, I mean, there's so much that I could dive into Lance on motivation and, and knowledge. I'm not sure how much <laughs> we want to nerd out on this episode, Um but there's well, let me let me just let, yeah. let me just encapsulate just a little bit. So sure. what you're saying is, you know, you got to find out what the heck it is that you, you want mm-hmm. and then break it into some smaller components. Uh, you got to have a, a way to you got to be at a you got to have a starting point. And then once you start this process, you get these little uh, uh, objectives that you want to accomplish on a daily basis. Then you got to be able to measure progress and. If you do this long enough, uh, you know, you're going to have some tough days where you don't feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about you need to get some motivation. So, yeah, let's talk about how do you on those days that you just don't feel like doing it, but, you know, it needs to be done. How do you how do you get going? Yeah. So I think I think there's several things that we can look at. We can look at, um, you know, expectancy. So your mind, your mind has to be in the right mind frame. Right. If, if you don't meditate, that might be something that you do. If you don't do breathing exercises, you know, that might be something that you start. So when you have those bad days, you can bring yourself back into that space where you're, you're, you're able to, to perform. Um, so expectations are very important. You have to have an expectation that there's some type of value in the behaviors that you're taking on. And when, when, when you expect that there's going to be value, when you expect that there's going to be some type of attainment or – or instrumentality to that value of your effort, that's going to help you stay motivated. When I say instrumentality, I mean like if you you want to be a better hockey player, well, what is something that's instrumental to that? 
right? Is it a sprint? Is it, is it some type of stick um, skill? Is it some type of shooting skill, some type of passing skill, right? What are those little skills that add to that big skill? So, so on those days where you don't feel like you're up to it, you have an expectation that if you continue to refine those smaller skills, you're still working towards that larger skill. And then when you accomplish those things, when you see those metrics improve, you're increasing your, you know, I, I say confidence because it's more easily understood, but it's actually self-efficacy. They're, they're kind of different things, but you in, increase your efficacy in doing that task. And with that increase in self-efficacy, that confidence, if you will, you're improving your orientation or your motivation to continue to work towards that goal. So that'd be one piece that's very important. Um, you, need to, you need to be able to attribute your work to improve performance. So let's say you choose a task that you're gonna do and that task is too audacious, right? It's too big, it's too complex. Um, you bit off more than you can chew. When that happens, you might not get the success that you're looking for you know, when you look at the metrics or when you're measuring it. So it's important to have that ability to reflect, okay, with well, here's where I'm at, here's where I'm performing, this is what I'm doing well, but having that ability to pivot and go another direction. Um, that's, that's really important, especially because you can actually demotivate yourself if you bite off more than you can chew, but there has to be an expectation that your behavior and your effort towards that goal is gonna result in something positive. So walking that line to make sure that, that the things that you're doing are working towards that goal is very important. Additionally, the environment's important. Um, you know, if you have an environment that's conducive to doing the training, uh, you know, if you're doing it in your living room, it works out great. But if you're doing it in your living room, and your dog keeps stealing your ball or your puck. I mean, that's going to be a problem, right? So making sure that yeah. you have that space to do those things that you want to do. So there's not all these, um, I guess, extraneous kind of, kind of things that are impacting your learning or your skill building. So making sure that environmentally your space is appropriate. And there's another component there too, this, this whole uh, performance versus mastery kind of dichotomy, right? In sports, we want to perform. We're performing to a certain metric, we're performing for, for, for a certain stat, for a certain you know, puck possession time, right? Or a certain score. The problem is, is when we do that, <coughs> excuse me, when we do that, the, the orientation of our effort is external to ourselves. We're doing it for that thing, right? Not for ourselves. So the whole mastery orientation really pulls that motivation inside. How can I master this? How can I do it in a way where I don't care about the score? I don't care about the, the stats. I'm doing it because I want to be a master at this. So there's a couple stages you know, of, of, of development that kind of play into that performance versus mastery. First, you know, it's, it's you know, you, when you're looking at this performance of this master, specifically mastery dynamic, you know, there's this whole spectrum from unconscious to, to competent, right? Where you, you might not be aware that you're working on this thing and you might not be good at it, right? Now, now conscious and incompetent means that you're aware of this thing, I'm working on this thing, but I'm still not good at it. Then there's a conscious and competent, which means I'm aware of this, and I've trained to the point where I'm good at it. And then when, when, when I talked about automation previously with training you know, specific to law enforcement or military, what we really wanna do when we're looking at mastery is getting to that point where we are not focused on, we're unconscious about our, our skills and, and what we're doing, but we're competent. So we've automated that, that skill set, And really that's where we want to be at, as players, as, as law enforcement officers, as soldiers, as, as EMTs, is where we're just operating because it's ingrained in us and what is ingrained in us is appropriate and, and effective. So with that, again, comes the self-confidence, the self-efficacy to, to continue to build upon that. And there's this whole other line now of, of positive psychology. Um, I read an article last week on, on broaden and build theory, and it talks about how when you're learning something in a positive environment, your, your thought repertoire or your ability to think beyond that, but with related issues really comes in. So you're able to expand your awareness to additional things that are gonna to continue to push your skill sets and your awareness in that space. So, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff going on 
in the motivation space with training and development. But I would come back to making sure that there's value in the effort that you're expending, not taking on too much, starting small and stacking those small wins into something that's bigger, making sure your environment is supportive, and then focus on mastery, not performance. Focus on performance as a secondary to mastery. Just spend a, a, a few minutes and talking about, you know, the, the reasoning behind chasing something, you know, are they uh, intrinsic or are they extrinsic? Because yeah. One, one, one's really good. One, not so good. <laughs> right. So, so that intrinsic drive, you know, typically the closer you can get to yourself, as far as your motivation is concerned, typically that's stronger and more long lasting that motivation is going to be. Um, you've heard incredible stories about, you know, people during the Hol Holocaust or whatever, like Viktor Frankl wrote a book, you know, man, um, I forget the exact name of it, uh, man versus meaning or something like that. But he talked about how, you know, despite an incredible scenario, his mindset was, despite what was going on around him, his mindset dictated how he was going to uh, get through that scenario. And, you know, I, I would look at that in the same way where if you have something that comes from within, it's you, it's part of you, it's coming from you. It's going to be much more greater than those things that come from the outside of you. So I think we've all been around, uh, you know, the playing field or the hockey rink enough where we can see those coaches that are, or those parents that are very overbearing, trying to get yeah. their kids to do well, barking at them, telling them what to do, telling them this, telling them that. And the kids out there on the field are on the ice frustrated, right? So when you look at that, this is a prime example of that. How can we as players or coaches or parents get our players to do it for themselves because they want to do it for themselves, right? That whole automation, yeah. that whole mastery. How can we have them do things because they're motivated to do it internally and not externally? And I think when you see those players that have gone the distance, sure, they've had people that have pushed them along the way, but I think if you were to dive into their stories, they'll tell you that although I had people push me along the way, I did a lot of work myself. Um, so I think that 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 internal that intrinsic motivation is it trumps extrinsic motivation. Um, I wouldn't say any day of the week, but I would say definitely when there's very difficult times or very difficult challenges occurring, that intrinsic motivation is going to carry people farther than something that's externally uh, applied to them. How how small is the gap from being average to being just a a notch up and a notch up is significant, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't take a whole lot of everyday time to get that. But, you know, why, why do you think some, some people reach higher levels and others don't? Yeah. I think a lot of people give up too early and I, I've been guilty of that myself. You know, you, you might be, you might be one day away, right? One practice away, one application away, one meeting away. to catch your second wind. Yeah. And to get that, that confidence or that boost, you know, if you've been struggling with something, you know, and I, I'm not sure uh, what that would look like, but let's say you're struggling to do a specific technique and you've been struggling yeah. for the longest time and you haven't been able to do that. And then at hour two of your two hour Friday afternoon practice, you nail it, right? What would happen if you didn't go to that practice? You'd continue down that same route. Right. But I think yeah. having those successes and not giving up and having that grit, that stick to um, you know, it can really it can really help. There's this big debate right now about motivation and discipline. Right. Which one's more important? You know, you've seen it on you've seen it on multiple other podcasts. You've seen it on multiple articles that come out. And I would argue that motivation is discipline. Right. Discipline yeah. is simply the systems that we use to motivate ourselves. Right. So if you're not a four o'clock riser and you don't naturally do that, you need a system in order to get yourself motivated to do that. Whether that's setting the alarm clock, you're creating a system to motivate yourself, right? So I think having those systems in place also, you know, that dis those discipline systems will affect that motivation when you're kind of on your last leg and you're looking to give up, um, just take that next step. It's always one more step. I mean, just one more, one more, 
one more hit, one more hour, one more, you name it. Just do one more. So how much, let's say someone wants to just make a, a positive change in their life. So they want to start journaling. They want to start meditating. Like you said, uh, uh, working on breathing techniques. What to, to make a significant change over, let's say a 30 day period, how much time do you have to invest daily to really see something significant that you notice? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, on, on the breathing side, there's a, a great book called peak mind by Dr. Amishi Jha, and she worked with Marines prior to deploying to um, Afghanistan and Iraq. And her program initially said, I don't want to say in the book is like two hours of, of mindfulness breathing training, right? Breath training. And they were able to get it down to a point where it's nine minutes and maintain efficacy in that. So if, if you're really looking to perform at a higher level, um, I would pick up her book. It's called Peak Mind by Mishi Jha, Dr. Mishi Jha. And I'm not in any way associated with her. It's just a book that I've read. Um, but I, it's helped me tremendously with my, with my uh, mindfulness and my awareness. And getting to the point where, you know, uh, you might be getting frustrated or things might be going to chaos around you. But really focusing on that breath and, and it immediately can take you back down. So I would say 26 days. Right, like 26 to 30 days, somewhere around there. Another thing that you can do is, is some of this positivity, um, like journaling. Uh, one of the things that I recommend to some of my clients is just everybody has a sticky, a sticky notepad, right? The little two inch by two inch sticky pads. Um, set it somewhere that you go every day, whether it's your bathroom mirror, or, you know, if you go go to do your business in the morning at the toilet, like just set it down somewhere. Write down three positive things that occurred or that happened to you either that day or the previous day. Um, and just write them down. And when you're done writing them, just throw them back in the pile, stick it back in the pile. When you're having a bad day, go back to that pile and read through them. You know, when you're having that day that says you can't do this anymore, you know, you're not good enough. You're never going to make it to that next level. Pick those things up and start reading through them. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to help rewire your brain to focus on the positive things rather than the negative things. You know, that negativity could really, really get going and, and really get you down. So, I think those are important from a journaling perspective. I think journaling is important and that's kind of a form of it, right? And those three, three positive things down, but journaling is important from the sense of, you know, you're activating different areas of your brain. Um, I don't know about you, but when I write, I write very differently than how I talk. So when you, when you look at it from that perspective, we're going to be able to activate different parts of our brain and different thought processes through journaling. Um, so for me, it's been helpful to journal. I've journaled. Uh, I don't do long ones. I just do real quick ones at the end of the day. Like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what worked. This is what went well. And this is what I can improve upon tomorrow. Um, so I think it's helpful to get those thoughts out that might be in your head. Get them out a different way. And, and oftentimes, at least for me, they come out in, in different ways of thinking about things that I might not have thought of otherwise. And really what we're doing is we're, we're activating that K in the framework that I developed. And that K is knowledge. And what we're talking about in that realm is the metacognitive knowledge, right? The ability to reflect on how we did or what we did, to analyze that, to kind of step out of ourselves, and then to develop a, a plan or an action plan moving forward. So that ability not only to recognize those things, but to, to articulate them and then develop a path forward based on that. So this Give me a, a minute or two on how important is, is it for young people to write down their goals, like to physically write them down and look at them every day? How important? Yeah, I think it's very important, uh, whether it's in your phone. Uh, typically, if you put stuff in your phone, though, it gets buried. So I might go with a, a little sticky note, put it on the, uh, on the mirror. I think it's that constant reminder. You know, we, 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 we give attention to the things that are in our awareness. And... You know, it's that whole thing of if, if you got a new car, let's say you're in high school and you got a new red Toyota you know, Tacoma, right? What, what do you see on the freeway? You see red Tacomas everywhere, right? Well, why do you see red Tacomas everywhere? Because it's important to you because you see it every day. You're in it. You're driving it, right? So I think it's important to see those things 
to remind yourself and to bring it into your awareness and keep it always in your awareness. Because whether, whether you are conscious of your brain paying attention to these things or not, your brain is always working in the background when we sleep, when we're awake, when we're at rest, it's constantly working. So when you surround yourself with those things that are important, in this case, your goal, your brain is going to recognize that your eyes or your brain might not physically see that when you walk by your bathroom, right? But out of your peripheral vision, you can still see it. Your brain is still processing it. It's going in there somehow, right? So yeah. I think I think it's very important to write those things down. And I would recommend, you know, at, at a second, put it in your phone, but as the first, put it somewhere where you see it, um, you know, on your binder or in your car, a little sticky note or something, right? And it doesn't even necessarily have to be words. Lance, you know, it could be something like, um, you know, communication happens in multiple ways. So it might be something that, like a symbol, you know, if you're, if you're focusing on, you know, I love this, this puck possession time study that you did. It's great. But if you're focusing on that, you know, maybe you put, put a little, you, you grab a puck and you put it on your dashboard and you draw a clock on it, you know, something yeah. like that as a metaphor for, Hey, this is what I'm working towards you know, it could be beneficial. And you might, you might find that it unlocks your mind in different ways because it, it might create connections that otherwise weren't there with just written language. Yeah. When I played, uh, I would have uh, words or just uh, the, the, the first letter of the word, whatever, like uh, focus mm -hmm. F I'll have it on my glove. You know, when I had a bad shift or something and mm -hmm. my mind started going mm -hmm. that I could, just look at that and that would disrupt what I was thinking. And I've also heard people that they'll, they'll have something in their wallet or their purse or in their car or something where they get, you know, some uh, unproductive thoughts. They'll look at that real quick. And again, to disrupt it. Uh, so that those are uh, great tips and strategies uh, to, to get through that because our, you know, the mind is a goofy thing. It's always going. And right. I, I think that, you know, you, you read so many books is if you, it's about mastering yourself, mm -hmm. you know, that's number one, then you can help people. If you can manage yourself and uh, on a consistent basis, then, then you can help other people do the same. Absolutely. So yeah, they said the gold, it wasn't the gold rush out in California. Man, yeah, it, it was, it's yeah. still going, it's still going on. You're just giving us all kinds of gold nuggets <laughs> here, my friend. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh we're getting close here and i i just um uh, i got a, a question that I, I i was listening to i don't know a podcast or something but uh the question was was uh what does courage or being courageous mean to you i thought it was a great question yeah i like that um i would say courage is doing things that you're afraid of doing um, and sometimes those things might come in the form of sticking up for somebody. It might come in the form of firing somebody. Uh, they might come in the form of, you know, putting your phone down and spending some time with your kids, right? It might come in the form of going on a date night with your wife, right? So there's all these things that I think courage uh, plays into, but it's doing things that you're fearful of doing. Um, I would pair with that, Lance. I would pair with that. Uh, it's important to be honorable in those things, because you can be courageous about some pretty dishonorable things, right? Yeah. But uh, I think it's important to be honorable about confronting those fears and taking action despite those fears, um, whether it's in business or, you know, with your personal relationships or if it's with yourself. Right. So I think it's important that, uh, and I think that's a great messaging. I, 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 I heard something as well. I listen to a lot of things every day. When I work out, I'm listening to things. And uh, as far as courageous, being courageous, it was something like this, that it's knowing you have to do something and you're scared shitless, mm -hmm. but you do it anyways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, man, this has been outstanding. I, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Uh, I think it's important that to, to say to all of our younger listeners, uh, anyone, I guess, that we've covered a lot, given a lot of uh, different suggestions on how to operate at a, a higher level. Uh, take Mr. Sinclair's uh, advice. You know, we, we, you can't bite off a ton of stuff. Just pick one and get that kind of dialed in and then add another thing. And I, I can speak from 
uh, experience that that's how it works. You kind of get one thing organized in your life and then you add another thing and pretty soon you got seven or eight things new in your life that you're really happy about and some of the things that you weren't too happy about no longer are part of your daily routine. Uh, and the other thing is you want to you want to change you you want to be like someone else then hang around people you want to be like you know what you do speaks louder than words your actions are, are huge so get around the right crowd and good things will happen um anything else that you would like to add to to help these young people uh become great and you also got to tell us where we can find you if people are interested in learning more about you, because you got your podcast too. Forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, I would say to all the youngsters out there, just work hard. Um, make every opportunity you have to make a decision. You can go right or you can go left and make that best decision that you can make because we are all one decision away from changing the trajectories of the rest of our lives. So make that good decision every single opportunity you get. Um, to get to, to dive a little bit into to what I do, Lance, uh, my my organization is called Sinclair Performance. Uh, you can reach out to me at SinclairPerformance.com on the contact page there. I'm happy to to discuss any of this with anybody. Feel free to reach out. Uh, you can also reach out at contact at SinclairPerformance.com if that works for you. Um, and then finally, the podcast is called The, the Performance Collective. Um, and in The Performance Collective, I talk with business owners, I talk with leaders, uh, basically high performing individuals, and we talk about things associated with expanding capacity, um, enhancing leadership, improving performance, and accelerating growth. So um, if, you're, if you're interested in checking that out, you can check it out on, on anywhere you can find a podcast, and there's also a YouTube channel. So Lance, I, I do appreciate uh, you having me on the show, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you know there's some value in our discussion today. So thank you. Absolutely. And uh, I'll, I'll make sure I put uh, uh, the book Peak Mind. I'll put that in the description as well. Uh, and also your, your websites in the podcast so people can uh, learn more and they can hear the podcast that uh, you and I did as well there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Mr. Sinclair, I want to thank you for being on the Hockey Journey podcast. The knowledge, tips, strategies you passed on to all of us here today uh, was, as they say, priceless. So thank you again for all the golden nuggets you floated out there. The question is, will we start to implement what we just learned? Only time will tell. So continued success, my friend. Thanks for being here. And if there's anything I can do to help you and what you have going on, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks again for being here, Jared. Excellent, Lance. Appreciate it. We'll do. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Dr. Jared Sinclair and hearing his life journey and how he's helping individuals, teams, and businesses reach higher levels of achievement by implementing success and tangibles one step at a time. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.